I'll make it out here. And for all the students and faculty, um, this just this makes me so happy to see so many of you um, able to attend during Congo Hour. There, we usually have so many competing events. So um, I just wanted to say a welcome to everyone. My name is Leila DeVries. I'm one of the sponsors from Hamlin University. I represent Global Studies and the Model UN uh, program. Uh, this event is also being sponsored by um, other departments at the university, including political science and psychology, and um, we are all thrilled to have our speakers here. Uh, I'm going to hand the podium over to um, Tim Roth, who will do the uh, official uh, introductions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Ross. I'm a retired lawyer and I do some work in the area of torture and also human rights. Um, I'm advocates for human rights, the center of victims of torture, the women against military men, the stacking torture at the top group, um, the Minnesota Peace Project, and a few others. Um, I've been asked to give introductions to our speakers today. Um, I'm going to introduce John Kiriakou first. Brad Olson is sitting immediately to my right. I'll give him a longer introduction before he speaks. But um, John is a former CIA analyst and case officer. He was a former senior investigator for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's been a counterterrorism committee consultant. Um, you know, he was employed by the CIA after 911. Uh, he refused to be trained in the enhanced interrogation techniques and he never authorized or used the techniques, which we all now know is torture, but I think he was one of the people on the front lines of discovering that and bringing it to people's attention. In fact, I think that um, he was the first former CIA employee or officer to confirm that the CIA had waterboarded um, detainees and, the, and he labeled waterboarding as torture, so he was perhaps the first person to bring this to the public's attention. Um, uh, anyway, uh, he was later subject to a government investigation, and um, he was a he was a whistleblower. Um, but like other whistleblowers, um, uh, he was. Uh, prosecuted because he revealed the name of a CIA agent to a reporter. The reporter never revealed it to the public, but he had revealed the name to someone, and so he was prosecuted for that. He ended up making a plea bargain and serving some time, but thank goodness he's out and can now spread the word to all of us again. So I'd like to give you to give a very warm welcome to John. I'd like to talk about, obviously, about torture, but I'd like to give you a little bit of background, too. Um, I spent about 14 and a half years in the CIA, first as an analyst, later as a counterterrorism operations officer. I got bored with analysis. And after the September 11th attacks, I became the chief of the CIA's uh, uh, anti-terrorism operations in Pakistan. In that capacity, I led a series of raids in which we captured uh, a Palestinian by the name of Abu Zubaydah, who at the time we thought was the number three in Al-Qaeda. That turned out to not be true. He was not the number three in Al-Qaeda. But our, our orders were to capture him. So we did. We captured him. It took about six weeks, but we found him. Uh, he was uh, shot very severely uh, by Pakistani police. And, uh, and I sat with him for the first 56 hours of his uh, captivity. We talked about a lot of things in those 56 hours. The September 11th attacks, um, poetry, religion, all different kinds of things. And, um, and I told him, and I, I didn't mean to, you know, to sound dramatic, but I told him, look, I am the nicest guy that you're going to meet in this experience. The nicest guy. My colleagues are not as nice as I am. So if I can give you any advice, 
it's that you have to cooperate. I told him, your life is over, but the rest of it can be easy or it can be terrible. I said, I don't really know what they have in mind for you, but I can tell you, because I know them, it's not going to be nice. And he said, you seem like a nice guy, but you're the enemy, and I'll never cooperate. So I said, well, suit yourself. So after 56 hours, he was flown to a secret prison. And after being given six weeks to recuperate from his very grave gunshot wounds, the CIA started torturing him. Now this was after the FBI had spent those intervening six weeks establishing a relationship with him and establishing a rapport. And he actually began providing his FBI interrogator with actionable intelligence. The CIA said that that wasn't good enough. And so George Tenet asked President Bush to evict the FBI from this country where the secret prison was located and to allow CIA officers to take over. In the meantime, I had returned to CIA headquarters and a senior officer in the CIA's counterterrorism center approached me and asked me if I wanted to be what he called certified in the use of enhanced interrogation techniques. I didn't know what that meant. I had never heard of enhanced interrogation techniques before. So I said, what do you mean? And he said very animatedly, we're going to start getting tough with these guys. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he gave me this list of 10 techniques that were going to be used against prisoners, beginning with Abu Zubaydah. I said, man, that sounds like torture. And, you know, you got to call it what it is. It just sounds like torture. It's not for me. I said, I have a moral, visceral problem with it. And I said, but you know what? Let me think about it for a couple of hours. And I went up to the CIA's seventh floor, that's the executive floor, and I spoke with a very senior CIA officer with whom I had had a, a relationship. I had worked for him for, for a little while in the Middle East. And I said, what do you think of this? They asked me if I wanted to do this. And he said, first of all, let's call it what it is. They can use whatever euphemism they want, but it's torture. Torture is illegal. And he said, you know your colleagues. You know what they're like. Somebody's going to go overboard, and they're going to kill a prisoner in custody. And when they kill a prisoner, there's going to be a congressional investigation. And then there's going to be a criminal investigation, and somebody's going to go to prison. Do you want to go to prison? I said, no, I don't want to go to prison. I'm the only one who went to prison at the end of it. But I said, no, I don't want to go to prison. I went back downstairs. I said, I have a problem with this. I think it's torture. I don't want to be involved. They had approached 14 of us. Two of us said no, and one of the two changed his mind and said yes. So they started torturing Abu Zubaydah. A lot has been made about the issue of waterboarding. I confirmed to ABC News in 2007 that we had waterboarded Abu Zubaydah, in addition to other things. But the CIA was using other techniques that I always thought were even worse than, than waterboarding. Waterboarding is the sense of, of drowning. You, you have some sort of material, burlap, cloth, plastic, whatever, over your mouth, and you're strapped to a gurney, your feet are slightly elevated, and water is poured on your face, and it makes you feel like you're drowning. It's very painful because your, your body is, is tensing and reacting, and it, it's very painful, especially in your abdominal muscles. But there are other things that the CIA was doing, like the cold cell. The cold cell is where a prisoner is stripped naked, he's chained to an eye bolt in the ceiling, and his cell is chilled to 50 degrees. And then every hour, somebody goes into the cell and throws ice water on it. We killed people using that technique. Mm. More than once, we killed people. But no one was ever prosecuted for that. There was another technique, sleep deprivation. Former Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld famously said that he got no sleep, that he had a stand-up desk. He didn't even have a seat at his desk. And he would work for two or three days, and he was fine. So that was not torture. But the CIA wasn't, wasn't keeping prisoners up for two days or three days. It was more like 12 days or 14 days chained to that eye bolt in the ceiling again. Well, you begin losing your mind around day seven. And in many cases, as my friend and, and colleague Brad here will tell you, in many cases, that, that insanity becomes permanent. We have prisoners now with whom we use the, the technique of sleep deprivation, who are unable to participate in their own defenses. That's illegal. We have laws that prohibit this kind of thing. We chose to ignore them. So in December 2007, I gave an interview to ABC News in which I said three things that utterly changed the course of the rest of my life. 
I said the CIA was torturing its prisoners. Torture was official U.S. government policy. And that policy had been approved by and signed by the President of the United States. Now, George W. Bush had said earlier that week, he had looked directly into the camera during a press conference, and he said, we do not torture. I knew that was a lie. And then a couple of days later, he told a reporter, you know, if there is torture, it's the result of a rogue CIA officer. And I knew that was a lie. He had approved this. He had signed it. And so I went on national television, and I called the President of the United States a bald-faced liar. Within two days, <laughs> I was audited by the IRS, which has continued every single year since 2007. The Justice Department began um, an investigation of me, which lasted until January of 2012. Now, interestingly enough, um, the FBI determined in 2009, uh, March of 2009, that I had not committed a crime. Uh, by, by going on ABC News and, and saying that we were torturing prisoners. The Obama uh, administration told the uh, Justice Department to reconsider that decision not to prosecute. And so I was charged with three counts of espionage in addition to violating the Intelligence Identities Protection Act and making a false statement, although I've never been clear on exactly what the false statement was supposed to have been. It, it was thrown out in any event. Um, but three counts of espionage. Now, the three counts of espionage were for revealing top secret code word information that the Justice Department said was declassified solely for the purpose of prosecuting me. And that top secret code word information that bought me three counts of espionage, one of the gravest crimes an American can face, was that the CIA, after 9-11, was trying to kill or capture members of Al-Qaeda. <laughs> this is a death penalty case we're talking about. Right? And they were going to be nice to me about it. They offered me 45 years. Yeah, 45 years in prison for revealing this unbelievably close, closely held top secret code word information that we were trying to kill Osama bin Laden after 9-11. After 9-11. Yeah. So in any event, like many defendants in America today, I took a plea to make it go away. I had five children at home. It was the prudent thing to do. But my time is over. I spent 23 months in federal prison. It just made me more um, determined to fight this abomination that's torture, this utter disrespect for our Constitution, for the law of the land. You know, like, like people on both the left and the right, I maintain that we are a country of laws. We're a country that has a working constitution, a living and breathing document, as some scholars say. And we need to respect that, that document. Without the constitution and the resulting respect that we all ought to have for human rights and civil liberties, what's the point in you know, having a country? It just doesn't seem to make any sense to me. So anyway, I promised Brad I would be very short, because we're going to try to take lots of questions. Thank you for having me. Please fight torture. I'm going to give a short introduction of Brad, too. Um, Brad is an assistant professor of psychology. Um, he's involved in a lot of organizations. He was one of the first uh, psychologists to pursue the fact that uh, the American Psychological Association um, also had kind of sinister connection with the enhanced interrogation techniques. Um, it was also covered up for a long time. Um, I don't, he, can, he can give you the details of how long it was covered up and, and what uh, actions they had to take to um, uncover it and uh, do an investigation and prepare a report and try to hold some of the people accountable. Um, He's a community psychologist. Um, he's worked on a lot of human and, and uh, civil rights issues. Um, president of the S Psychologists for Social Responsibility, co-founder of the Coalition for Ethical Psychology, and he's president-elect of the Society for the Study of Peace, Conflict, and Violence, and a past chair of uh, 
several divisions um, uh, of the APA, the American Psychological Association, and he's a professor at National Lewis University in Chicago. So please welcome Brad. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, thanks for inviting me into tackling our torture at the top committee. Everybody should read their materials and consider joining this organization. They are just uh, feisty and committed, and uh, and they're they are what is going to stop torture in the future here. And people like John. I mean, it's kind of uh, funny for me. I mean, there are risks in academia to uh, fighting torture. It's a little bit, uh, it's not, you know, fighting the American Psychological Association is not quite like fighting the CIA within the inside side. And uh, we we have uh, for a long time really in, admired John. Uh, I mean, John, his bold moves in 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 prison. I mean, writing to the outside world. Um, he is he is a courageous man, and um, I told him that <laughs> it was uh, consider buying his book. I mean, it's uh, it's incredible. Um, so one one more one more. <laughs> question for, for you. So you're all gonna have to. Someone's gonna have to stop me after after 15 minutes. But all of you have taken. Uh, at least introduction to psychology courses probably so you know some of the fundamental the Milgram obedience experiments and the um, what what clinical psychology is Zimbardo that we have uh, ethical codes that clinicians are not supposed to sleep with their clients because we sort of have uh, this this power um, I you know I don't know if psychologists uh, have a real power with our tools of psychology um, we do have other forms of power in, the, in terms of respect, and I think part of what gives us that power is our ethics, that, that we do believe that we have a moral code and that we will not violate it. And so what I'm going to actually talk about is, is a little bit less about torture, although it is about torture, but it's more about the corruption of, of civil society. And so to have a profession uh, like medicine, psychiatry, psychology, uh, being involved in torture, uh, that's, you know, that's adds a, another scary element to it. When the people who are supposed to be healing mental health are actually reverse engineering those techniques, as the techniques John talked about, the enhanced interrogation techniques, to torture using psychological pain, creating post-traumatic stress disorder, and, uh, and making it so these individuals cannot even uh, be tried. Um, so John already gave a great introduction to that, but basically in 2005, after Abu Ghraib, uh, Guantanamo, CIA black sites, all this information was coming out, uh, the CIA and the Department of Defense needed psychologists. They needed psychologists uh, because they thought they could get more information. They, they thought psychologists would be able to help with interrogations. I actually think um, someone with uh, John's charm can, can get information out of people better than a psychologist could. Uh, but the psychologists were really used to legitimize torture. So uh, the definition of psychological torture, the invisible form of torture, was basically if you create post-traumatic stress disorder, that is torture. And we all know that there are many, many sort of psychological and painful techniques that can lead up to that, that can lead up to trauma, and that no psychologist is able to say, okay, if you stop there, uh, PTSD will not occur. But given this redefinition of psychological torture, psychologists needed to be in these places, I mean, according to intelligence. One, one, one CIA document we found was that a psychologist was present in every instance of CIA waterboarding, basically to say, stop, because if you keep going, it's gonna lead to a permanent disorder. So I mean, it is like, this is the dark side, and this is the dark side of, of our field of, of psychology and other fields as well. So basically the American Medical Association, American Psychiatric Association said there is no role for, for physicians or psychiatrists to be part of these national security interrogations. American Psychological Association came out with a task force that was made up of mostly Department of Defense people, 
people we later found out were, were in the chain of command in places where torture was occurring. And this uh, task force basically said psychologists will play an important role in the national security process through interrogations. So uh, behavioral science consultant teams, psychologists would, would guide interrogations, locate vulnerabilities, they designed detention um, punishment paradigms, removal of toilet paper. Eventually, originally this was psychiatrists and psychologists guiding these much of these interrogations. And um, eventually the Department of Defense said, we're, we're going to use psychologists over psychiatrists. So this is not a sort of story about me, but it's a story of, I don't know, there's, there's five of us psychologists who were really brought together to, to work on this issue, and then there are maybe another 40 who have also really put pressure. Psychology, the American Psychological Association is the largest body of psychologists in the world. And uh, what we suspected from the beginning, but we didn't even know it was this bad, that this Pence task force that made this decision, they were made, they, um, these decisions were made by the CIA and by the Department of Defense before that, that uh, essentially the, the, the lessons or the, the guidelines in those report, the, that report was created by intelligence in the military um, before this task force even started. Fortunately, one of my close colleagues, Jean Maria Rigo, was a whistleblower on that task force, gave us information. We were brought in, Physicians for Human Rights, everyone who's speaking up about this issue, they brought us together. And since then, we formed the Coalition for Ethical Psychology. And we sort of became investigative psychologists. We, um, I mean, for the last 10 years, 20 emails a day at least go back and forth, us figuring out what's going on. We did not have that outside information, but using our psychological skills and Google, um, it's amazing what we could find and what we could uncover. And so we changed American Psychological Association policies by putting pressure on them through open letters, through co committees, all sorts of events. Uh, many people resigned from the American Psychological Association, thousands and thousands. Uh, it's a group of 100,000 uh, psychologists. And eventually we put together a referendum because the internal council of APA wasn't going to do anything. So we got the membership to vote on an issue and we won that referendum that basically said psychologists cannot be <laughs> at any national security site that violates either the, the U.S. Constitution or international law. But of course, the American Psychological Association still fought Guantanamo is not a violation of, of uh, U.S. Constitution or international law. As John pointed out, uh, it is. And so um, it's just, it's been a long, long fight the APA has promised accountability. They had names of psychologists who were engaged in torture. They had the names of uh, James Mitchell, who was an APA member um, in 2006 and is now being sued by the ACLU, an, an architect of the torture program. Um, so they, the, the, the APA has not done, their ethics office had not done anything to, um, to look into these cases. I mean, we had very, very clear, clear evidence. But eventually, um, a, a couple key pieces came out, and I think this is where I played a little bit bigger role. One was uh, uh, Kevin Kiley, the Surgeon General of the Army, was, giving a, was having a debate with Physicians for Human Rights at, um, in Chicago, and I went up to Kiley afterwards, I'm like, what do you think about these biscuits? And he said, oh yeah, I talked to this uh, Donovan the other day, they're great. And it turned out that Donovan, Deborah Donovan, was married to the head of the APA practice directorate. She was a Guantanamo biscuit, we later figured out. And this head of the APA practice directorate, I'm sorry, there's a lot of names here, but he basically influenced this Pence task force from the beginning. So what a conflict of interest. He never mentions that his wife, uh, he, he controls this task force and never mentioned that his wife was a biscuit. 
Um, a biscuit, the behavioral science consultant. That's the psychologist who guides the interrogations. So, yeah, no, please jump in for clarifications. I'm, I'm trying to go quick to, to, uh, to meet John's time here. Um, because since I asked him to uh, uh, give me a little bit, he didn't need to give me that much. But uh, the, the, the happy news is, uh, so we found out that, we found out Rand Corporation had this really suspicious study that they were doing at Guantanamo. So I called someone I knew in the, the substance abuse research world and asked at Rand and said, what's going on? What is Rand studying here with Guantanamo? He's like, I don't know, that's really creepy. I don't, I don't go down that hallway, but I know a guy. And so I called this guy, Scott Gearware, and he was this really enthusiastic young man, really into to psychology, and, and, um, but he, he wanted to use it, you know, psychology for interrogations. And uh, he had also worked with, with APA on a couple of CIA workshops. But he basically, um, we lost him after a while. Uh, physician, a guy from Physicians for Human Rights hooked up with Scott, and then Scott got murdered. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not murdered. That, that, what, a, what a Freudian slip. <laughs> he was hit by a dump truck on, on his mo motorcycle. Um, so forget the murder part. Um, but, uh, but anyways, uh, his widow gave the, his email um, correspondence with the American Psychological Association to Physicians for Human Rights. We passed it on to Jim Risen of the New York Times. Jim Risen, in his book, came out with a chapter on the APA issue and, uh, and, and wrote about it in the New York Times. APA came after Jim Risen, and that made Jim Risen mad, which was not a good thing. So that battle began, and then the APA said, we have to do something. So they hired an independent attorney, David Hoffman, Chicago, Sidley Austin, who wrote a 500-some page report that um, essentially, at the end of it, and this was the good news, um, said that the critics' understanding of, of the Pence Task Force was correct. APA officials colluded with DOD officials loosened the APA ethics code, and already added to the porous legal constraints that already existed. And uh, had it gone differently, um, psychologists would have had a more difficult time harming detainees. And um, so he had a message to the field of psychology that, uh, that we do as psychologists have a special skill that can heal or damage, and uh, when the profession allows for the infliction of pain, on those with an inability to resist, the faith in the profession can diminish. And so we as a field need to define for itself what is ethical and legitimate. And, uh, and I'll stop there. So we have a short-term short success here, um, but changing that big institution of the APA is a little tougher. I'm going to give a little, I call it my elevator speech about a law that is in the process of being enacted. Um, it's actually an amendment to the National Defense um, Authorization Act of 2016. Um, two and a half years ago, after a group called the Constitution Project wrote another 500-page report, um, it was a bipartisan kind of blue-ribbon task force, and uh, they, they wrote a 550-page report, very comprehensive report, I think the most comprehensive report as of the time um, about torture, and it was a bipartisan group, and yes, they confirmed that the enhanced interrogation techniques were torture. Um, they interviewed hundreds of witnesses, their investigation took over two years, they had no access to the CIA or any government records because they were they didn't have subpoena power. They were an independent, nonprofit group. But after they wrote that report, um, I read it from cover to cover, and then I talked to the lawyer for the group, and I asked, um, has anybody drafted a bill um, to deal with this? And there already were the Geneva Conventions. There was the Convention Against Torture. There was the US Anti-Torture Act. Um, one would think that would have been enough. But um, I think the term that Brad used was 
the poorest legal constraints. Mm. Um, there were some uh, creative people who, I, I, I don't say they found loopholes, they created loopholes in existing law. And so far they've gotten away with it. None of them have been prosecuted. Um, so anyway, I looked at the fact that there did still seem to be some loopholes. Mm. So I wrote yet another <laughs> anti-torture bill and submitted it to the Minnesota Congressional Delegation. And it sat there for a while um, because uh, in consulting with Scott Ream at the Constitution Project, he said, um, you're only going to have one chance at this, and you have to wait until the stars are in the right alignment. Mm -hmm. So we waited. I mean, we did take it back to the members of the Minnesota Congressional Delegation from time to time, and we talked about it. Um, but then we also knew that the Senate Intelligence Committee was conducting its own investigation, and unlike everybody else, uh, they did have subpoena power. They were able to subpoena extensive CIA records. They couldn't get anybody from the CIA to cooperate um, or testify, but they got a lot of information. And they finished a 6,500 page report, um, and then it, it was classified. So the Senate Intelligence Committee had to decide whether or not they would make it public. And so uh, in April of 2014, the Senate Intelligence Committee did vote that it should be made public. But then it had to go to the CIA and the White House for redactions. Um, some of us thought it would never um, get out of the CIA and the White House. But in fact, in December of last year, um, they released a 550-page executive summary and findings with redactions, of course. Um, but that was a pretty revealing document. The rest of it has not been released yet. But um, there was also an uproar created because um, the CIA was monitoring the Senate Intelligence Committee while they were conducting the investigation. Um, but uh, the CIA denied that they were monitoring the Senate Intelligence Committee. The Senate Intelligence Committee is supposed to have oversight over the CIA, but um, John, John, John can tell you about who has oversight over who. Um, anyway, um, uh, Diane Feinstein, who was then the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, got upset. And she's not a very good person to get on the wrong side of. Um, in fact, she's a terrible person to get on the wrong side of. Um, if you'll pardon the language, you know, I sometimes like to say they fucked with the wrong person. <laughs> well, they did with her. Um, and John Brennan, who's the um, head of the CIA, basically called Diane Feinstein a liar. And um, that made her even madder. Um, and then uh, uh, it was basically real that, surprise, surprise, it was John Brennan who was the liar because it was proved that they were monitoring the investigators while they were investigating. Um, so now we decided uh, the stars might be in the right alignment because uh, they pissed off Ken Feinstein. And so uh, I actually took the bill back to Senator Klobuchar and talked with her staff about it. And her staff put me in contact with uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee. And they were just starting to draft a bill. So I gave them my bill. And then they basically consulted with me about what the language was. And they came up with a new bill. Um, they decided that in order to get it through the current Congress, um, it might be a good idea if they could convince John McCain to put his name on it. Um, John McCain, of course, is a famous torture victim from the Vietnam era. And um, currently, he's also the chair of the Senate Armed Services Committee. So they introduced the McCain-Feinstein Amendment to the 2016 National Defense Authorization Act in June, and it was passed. Um, the House had passed a version of the National Defense Authorization Act without any anti-torture language. So it had to go to a conference committee 
The conference committee was headed by a guy named Mac Thornberry, who is a Republican from Texas, and he thinks that torture should be legal. <laughs> so, you know, at every, just about at every juncture where you're trying to expose illegal torture, there's somebody in authority who thinks it either is legal or needs to be legal. But uh, John McCain bullied Mac <laughs> Thornberry enough, so it did survive the conference committee. And uh, it has been passed by both the House and the Senate. Um, President Obama vetoed the National Defense Authorization Act because of some funding provisions in it. They were trying to sneak some money um, into the Overseas Contingency Fund to get around the restrictions that uh, were created a few years ago in the budget. Um, and uh, a lot of people didn't like it, including President Obama, so he vetoed it. So they went back and they fixed that part of the bill, and they repassed it. It's passed the House, it's passed the Senate, it's soon going to be sitting on President Obama's desk, so we'll see what he does. Um, that's kind of the good part. The bad part is um, the provision to close Guantanamo that has survived um, is basically a provision to not close Guantanamo. Um, there are 113 prisoners left, I think, detainees. Um, uh, there is a process for um, releasing them, but it's a very torturous process, if you'll excuse my wording. Um, and this bill has actually made it worse. So, um, uh, and it's sitting on uh, President Obama's desk, um, if you feel strongly about closing Guantanamo, you might want to give the White House a call and um, tell President Obama to veto it again until they fix the Guantanamo provision. Um, now I'll open it up for um, questions. Um, yes, sir. Um, back in the, the uh, ideal days of my youth, this would be like a huge story. And I think, and the TV stations would be here, and the papers would be here, but I bet they're not here. And so my question for your distinguished guests is, what's your theory about why our mainstream media just doesn't care very much about this kind of important story? You know, in January of 1968, the Washington Post ran a, a front page photograph of a, an American soldier waterboarding a North Vietnamese prisoner. And the day that that photograph was published, Secretary of Defense McNamara ordered an investigation. The soldier was arrested. He was charged with torture. He was convicted and imprisoned. The law has not changed since 1968. The law is the same. Uh, it was the same in 2002 as it was in 68. It's the same in 2015 as it was in 1968. So what's changed? Number one, the Patriot Act, the so-called Patriot Act, which is, which is monumentally unpatriotic if you ask me. Um, and along with the Patriot Act and the shock of, of the September 11th attacks, the American people have <coughs> incrementally given up many of their civil liberties. And it's happened so, so quietly that it's, been, it's, it's insidious. And we've gotten to the point where, well, Daniel Ellsberg told me we've gotten to the point where Every dirty trick that the Nixon White House pulled against him uh, after leaking the Pentagon Papers is now legal because of the Patriot Act. Uh, and I think that because the American people don't seem to be outraged, the press really isn't outraged. Uh, we can have a whole conversation about corporate ownership of the mainstream media, um, which I think is also a problem. But so long as we aren't in the streets you know, in large numbers, I don't think the media is really going to care about this information. It's heartbreaking to me. Yeah, I, I agree absolutely with everything John said. And just to, to add to that from a psychological perspective, I mean, the CIA, the U.S. is always tortured. But at least at one point it was underground. With the Bush administration, it, it was above ground and it became acceptable due to fear, due to our, our giving up of our, of, our um, of human rights and, and civil liberties. Um, and that's part of what activism is about, is at least, the very least, to push it back underground, to make it so that it, it is unacceptable to, uh, to praise and talk about. 
And I also, I'm also going to blame, blame our schools. I don't think we have the same sort of moral, ethical uh, discussions that we used to. It's too much standardized testing and too little uh, humanization of, of, of our country and world. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so this is uh, about, I have a question about torture of um, people and who are mentally incompetent to resist. So I'm uh, 41 years old, and in 1983, my dad was committed to St. Peter Mental Hospital. Mm -hmm. He was in a good state of mind. When he left 11 years later, um, he was in a very bad state of mind. Since then, I've gotten the courage to go through his records from St. Peter, and it is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. He was deprived, they had a deprivational program for him if he wasn't, um, if he was delusional, he was diagnosed with undifferentiated schizophrenia. So they would isolate him for 90% of the time. Now, what I'm wondering now, um, it appears that in 1994 some law was passed. What I'm not wondering now is, uh, all these years later, 41 years old, this happened when I was eight. I'm really mad. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a master's degree in education. And I want to do something about this. And the general layperson, you know, the 550 page report, I mean, that's, that's great information. I'm glad that's there. But the general layperson who wants to defend these people who are vulnerable, vulnerable people, you know, whether or not they're in Guantanamo Bay or St. Peter Mental Institute, it's the same darn thing. You know, how can I help them? You know, what can I do? Because nobody cares. Nobody cares about, you know, the ma mainstream media doesn't care about people in mental hospitals. So what can I do? So I, I, so I would say that, that many of us psychologists and, and, and the forensic psychologists who work, uh, the, the psychiatrists, the psychologists who work in mental institutions, the forensic psychologists who work in our prison systems, uh, who engage in, in uh, sensory deprivation. Um, I think most of us sort of dissidents and act activists in the psychology world uh, see the linkages from um, these national security settings and this torture to what's happening in our prisons and, um, and in uh, other institutions that are supposedly trying to uh, create greater well-being and mental health. And so many of us see this as, as the exact opposite of what uh, should be done. And, um, and I do think there's continuity. I think we need to press that continuity and, and not pretend that this torture that's going in Guantanamo and CIA black sites and elsewhere um, is completely separate from what's happening in our criminal justice system and in some of the psychiatric institutions. So um, I'm making those linkages and uh, getting the word out, blogging, um, taking on some of these um, psychological and psychiatric associations. I mean, I think all of that, everything that, that we've kind of been doing. John, do you yeah, want to add to that? I'm, I'm going to add one more thing. Uh, I gave a speech in, a couple of weeks ago in North Carolina, and I, I always say when I'm speaking to, uh, to groups of young people that I'm a realist, and I know that the CIA is here to stay, and the only way to change the CIA is from inside. So I encourage people to you know, join the CIA if you want to try to change the CIA's culture. And then somebody said to me, you know, I'm 72 years old, and I want to make a change, and I can't join the CIA. <laughs> And I said, that's a really good point that I hadn't considered. <laughs> and he said, well, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to sue the bastards. And I got to thinking about that, and I think that's a great idea. We need to be litigious pricks when it comes to these issues, because the mainstream media is not covering it. Congress doesn't take their oversight responsibility seriously enough. So what can we do as citizens? If we have standing, we can sue. If we don't have standing, we can complain to licensing boards. We can write letters to the editor. We can write blogs, like you said. We can do podcasts. We can do all kinds of different things to get the word out. And I think that, that most of us don't even really consider it. I, I do this sort of professionally now, and I hadn't considered it. But there are a lot of things we can do. We can make it difficult for the people who have made it difficult for others. And I shouldn't have said nobody cares. I mean, people care, but I just think people don't understand. They think someone goes to them, the psychiatric facility, and then they're getting they're getting help. Sure. And they're not. And they're Same not. in prison. 
Yep. And there, there, there are, are two drugs everybody gets in prison. You can either have Tylenol, 800 milligram big Tylenols, or Zoloft, and wow. that's it. And the rest is up to you. Wow. I guess the question that has been asked a lot is about the idea of prosecution for people who have been involved in the torture program. And I guess there's several layers to it, but how do you think prosecution could even go about? Is that even a possibility to prosecute? And if so, how do you determine who would be prosecuted? And I guess there's so many things to determine about who to prosecute and how would you even go about it? So I hope that. Oh, I, I think I can tell you who to prosecute. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you. In all, in all seriousness, I mean, my own personal belief is that George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and, and others, George Tenet, uh, Don Rumsfeld, are war criminals. And in any other country, they would be prosecuted. But we're not going to prosecute them. And I understand if the president decides not to prosecute CIA officers who believed that they were operating within the confines of the law, right? So if you're a CIA officer in the field, you're not an attorney, you get a cable saying the Justice Department approved these uh, techniques, so they're legal, so go ahead and do them. If you have a problem in your gut, or even if you don't have a problem in your gut, I can, I can understand if people believed they were acting legally. But what about those people that we now know about from the Senate Torture Report who killed prisoners? in custody, or who sexually assaulted prisoners in custody. Um, what did they call with the hummus? They called it rectal rehydration, mm -hmm. using hummus. That's not that's a recognized medical procedure. <laughs> that's, that's rape, is what it is. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we prosecuting those CIA officers? No one at the Justice Department ever told them that they could murder people in interrogations, or, or sexually assault them. So, that disappoints me greatly. The president ought to be bigger than he's been and ought to insist that these officers be prosecuted. The problem we're running up against now is the statute of limitations. And this has been the, the idea all along. You just delay this and delay and delay and delay and eventually the statute of limitations will expire and nobody's going to be prosecuted. And that's what the White House has been banking on. And, and in addition to the, the legal prosecutions, I mean, there are other forms of accountability that have to occur. So for instance, the dean of DePaul University, who uh, fought us tooth and nail all the way through these 10 years, is now under a lot of pressure uh, to step down from the dean position into a uh, professorship. And then the president just wrote a letter basically saying that he will not do anything. So um, there are licensing boards, but but yeah, I mean, the legal pathway, and it, it's tough. I mean, a lot of us are pacifists. We want to, we're into forgiveness, but there does have to be some accountability to prevent this from happening in the future. I, earlier you said that uh, in effect, 13 out of 14 people who were invited by management to participate in the torture program chose to. And so I wonder how many people, from what you know and what's happened since, do you think would um, take that offer today? And what kinds of things uh, you know, went into their decision? You talked a little bit about your thoughts, but I assume some of the others must have thought it over a little bit. They, they and had, yeah. maybe this relates a little bit to the idea of changing the CIA from within, too. Oh, that's a really great question. Actually, nobody's asked me that question before. Um, yeah, I think that, that for many of those other 13 officers, the trauma of 9-11 was still so fresh that even if they had had moral qualms about uh, doing this, they set those aside and did it anyway. So I think that, I think that a lot of people, especially in the CIA, were still shocked by 9-11 and wanted to at least feel like they were doing something to, to make it right, to make it good. Um, we also know from the Senate Torture Report that there were officers already in the field who when they got orders to begin torturing said, wait a minute, I didn't sign on for this. This looks torture. And in at least a couple of cases that the Senate uh, Select Committee on Intelligence documented, uh, they insisted on coming home rather than to remain in the field and, and torture prisoners. One thing that does disappoint me, though, is um, 
it's been almost eight years now since I went on ABC News and talked about torture. And in those eight years, not a single CIA officer has come forward and said, you know, I was part of the torture program, it was wrong, it shouldn't have happened. Nobody's ever said that. And that's very disappointing to me. As a psychologist, what is it about your personalities? <laughs> you know, I, I like to... I'd like to. Is there something wrong? Uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. A CIA psychiatrist told me one time, and you and I have talked about this. A CIA psychiatrist told me one time that the CIA actively seeks to hire people with sociopathic tendencies, <laughs> not sociopaths. Sociopaths um, easily pass polygraphs because they have no conscience, right? But people with sociopathic tendencies are comfortable operating in moral and legal and ethical gray areas. So, if I get a cable from the field saying, hey, uh, go break into this house and steal this politician's file, I say, okay. I go fly to whatever country and I break into the house and I steal the file because that's my job. But, you gotta draw the line somewhere, right? The CIA doesn't teach ethics. There are no ethics courses, there's no instruction, there's no advice, there's nobody you can go to and say, I'm, I've got this ethical dilemma, what should I do? You just have to carry it in with you. You've got to have your own moral code. And I was, I was raised as part of what I like to call the Christian left. And, um, and my, by God, there were things that are black and white, right and wrong, and torture's wrong. And it was, it was a very clear line for me. Just in response to the, the statute of limitations for the lawsuit, there is no statute of limitations on murder. Correct. And luckily, for the law, for the lawsuits, mm -hmm. there are the murders. Yes, we. And, uh, it's sad to say, but at least we have the murders. Yeah, uh, it seems like the big enemy here is the military. We are such a military society now. Uh, it's not just the corporations that own the media; it's the military corporations that own the media, and they don't want peace because then they're going to lose profits. Mm -hmm. The military is using the police forces around the country to experiment on techniques, to give the military equipment and encourage the, the sociopaths and the psychopaths to go way over. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the military finances the universities. So every, that every sporting the, event. Every sporting event. Military. Uh, we need to cut the military budget down to about four dollars a year <laughs> and then they won't have the money to infiltrate every aspect of our society what can we do to wake people up to the fact that the military is not helping me at this point it's ruining my society I had dinner last night with a, a dear friend of mine who um, is a former assistant secretary of defense and he's left government and he's become something of a peace activist and he was an assistant secretary of defense during the George W. Bush administration, and he's become a peace activist. And he said, you know, he hadn't even really thought about it until recently, but we've been at war, essentially, since 1990, when he and I met. And he said, we've gotten to the point where our entire economy is a war-based economy, that if we stop fighting wars, we're going to go into a recession, and probably quite a prolonged recession, because the, the country... The country runs by financing the likes of Boeing and Lockheed Martin and other major defense contractors. And he said, when did this happen? It didn't even, we didn't even realize that it was happening. And this is a guy talking from the inside. And the only thing we could think of to do was to really ride our elected officials. I understand Frank Church is dead, Otis Pike is dead, those giants of the 1970s who took oversight very seriously are all gone. Um, but we need to demand and to insist that our elected officials exercise oversight, which they, which they don't do. Dianne Feinstein, I'm sure, is a perfectly <coughs> lovely person, but Dianne Feinstein is one of the CIA's greatest cheerleaders on Capitol Hill, yeah. and she has, for her, she has been for her entire career. So for Dianne Feinstein to come out against John Brennan was monumental. I mean, Brennan really screwed her to make her come out on the floor of the Senate and denounce the CIA and John Brennan. But that was kind of a one-off. We need to demand that our, our elected officials who are members 
of the Armed Services Committees and the Foreign Relations and Foreign Affairs Committees and the Select Committees on Intelligence really exercise oversight and, and bring these programs to a halt when they're no longer needed. And we're not seeing that. Well, for the people that you <clears throat> talk about prosecuting, good Lord, what about the legal profession? I mean, the medical profession failed us. The psychiatric profession failed us. The nursing profession failed us. But how about John Yu sitting there in the White House office crafting illegal documentation? With a straight face. Yeah, for, for all that, so that George Bush could say, it's all legal. See, John Yu told me so. Right. And, and he, what does he end up with? Yeah, does he go to jail? Oh, no, he gets a slick professional, the slick job in, was it Berkeley, Berkeley. Law School? Berkeley. Yeah, I mean, where is that profession? They have, you know, here's this, here's this 535 <laughs> legislature, legislators, probably 80% of whom are lawyers. Um, you know, give me a break. One of my 11 lawyers, um, is, is Jessalyn Radak, who, uh, who recently headed the national security practice at uh, the Government Accountability Project, whistleblower.org, and is now with exposedfacts.org. But Jessalyn was the chief of professional ethics at the Justice Department in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. She happened to be on duty the, the day that um, American military forces captured John Walker Lind, who became known as the American Taliban. So the FBI called from Afghanistan. Jessalyn answered the phone, and they said, we just caught an American citizen in a fort during a gun battle with the Taliban. What do we do? And she said, you have to read him his rights. He's an American citizen, and he has constitutional rights. You have to read him his rights. They didn't. A couple of days later, Attorney General Ashcroft went on TV and said he was read his rights, he waived them, and he confessed. That was a lie. He had not been read his rights, he had not waived them, and he had not seen an attorney. When Jessalyn complained about this, she was told to mind her own business. She decided to make a copy of all the emails that had gone back and forth between the Justice Department and the FBI. The emails had been purged. Right? There were only two left. So she took the two that were left and she sent them to Newsweek, to Mike Isikoff at Newsweek. Mike Isikoff, who must have been half brain dead that day, published the emails without blacking out Jessalyn's name. Oh. Right? She was escorted out of the Justice Department and fired for blowing the whistle on the fact that the Justice Department and the FBI had violated John Walker Lind's constitutional rights. Not only was she fired, she was blacklisted from a firm that had agreed to hire her in the aftermath of, of all this and fired from that firm. The Justice Department asked the DC bar to disbar her, wow. right? Interestingly enough, for violating professional ethics. And then, just to make sure that it really hurt, they put her on the no-fly list as a terrorist sympathizer. Mm -hmm. This is the Justice Department that did this. So, sure, we've got, we've got John Yu, and we have uh, Bybee, and what, what the others? Delahunty. Dela These guys are in up to their necks, and, and at the very least should have lost their law licenses for what they did. But it's bigger than that. It goes beyond those guys. It's not just the ones who have, who have twisted and bastardized the law to try to... Um, to try to make a, make a legal case for torture. It's all these other ones, too, who try to, to quash any dissent. And it's not just at the Justice Department. It's at the CIA. It's at the FBI. It's at NSA. You can't believe what NSA has done to some of their employees. Tom Drake, Kirk Wiebe, Bill Binney. It's a, it's a nightmare, and it's government-wide. How about a couple more questions? Do we have, Colleen, is that, where's Colleen? Right here. Is, is that okay? Yeah. I, I don't know. Is the room okay? One more question. One more. One, till one o'clock. Oh, one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can take a couple more and then maybe if people are interested, hang around and, uh, and sign book sign. John, with all the benefits of hindsight, 
is there anything that could have been done or you might have done to make a great, your message have a greater impact than it did? Yes. Um, yeah, th there, there are two things. One, one is personal. I should have hired an attorney before I wanted ABC News rather than after. That was a personal mistake. Um, but secondly, I tried to, I tried to be nuanced in my explanation of what was happening inside the CIA after September 11th when I talked to Brian Ross at ABC News. I shouldn't have been nuanced because either the American people are too stupid to understand nuance, or most people are so ideological that they just decided to ignore nuance. And I learned that with a message like the message that I had, that we're torturing prisoners and torture was wrong, you really need to hit people over the head with it. You can't say, well, you know, we're doing this thing, and there are these really smart people, and they disagreed. You can't do that. You have to say, it's happening, it's wrong, it's illegal, and the president should do something about it. Hey, um, I'm a former soldier uh, stationed at Fort Benning. Um, I found out what the uh, SOA is and, and what they were teaching there. And I decided to vacate the military at that point in time. Fantastic. And when I say vacate, I mean I walked away. I walked off base. And subsequently, I was you know, kidnapped and caged much like yourself, yeah, but sure. for a much shorter period of time. And I wanted to let you know that you know, you're not alone out there, and there wow. are people that, that, that are standing out there. Well, thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you said something. I'm going to put a plug in too for an organization that I that I became aware of when I was in prison called Quaker House. It's in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and they've been around since 1969 solely for the purpose of helping people like you who have had second thoughts about military service based on what they've seen in the military. Um, Thank goodness that there are organizations, there aren't a lot of them, but there are organizations like Quaker House where you can go and get free legal assistance and free counseling and have people really help you sort through these things. It was a very brave thing that you did. Thanks for saying something. Thank you. I, I don't know how to say this without sounding stupid. <laughs> But the American public is so willing to swallow fear tactics by our politicians, yeah. our military, etc. Is what can we do about that? Uh, Nothing. Like lemmings right over a cliff. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asked me the other day if uh, if the CIA has closed all of its secret prisons and torture sites, and I said I I don't know. This was a reporter, and the reporter said, but they, but they say they have, and the president says they have. And I said, but you know what? From when this first started, they have lied at every single step of the way. Every single thing that has come from the mouths of John Brennan and David Petraeus and Leon Panetta and Mike Hayden, another war criminal, and Porter Goss and George Tennant has been a lie. And then when they're caught in a lie, they say, well, and General Clapper is a prime example, well, it was, what did he say? It was less incorrect to say, yeah, less, that's, that's right. It was less untruthful to say yes than no. Well, actually, when the answer is no, then you're just lying. So... The, the third point is that say? we, you know, I mean, hearing all of this, I mean, it's, it's both energizing, but it's also sort of sad and depressing, sad, just, yeah. just yeah. how uh, oppressive the system is. But on the other hand, we don't, there is a lot of fear, but we don't need to convince everybody. We just need to have a big enough voice to push things to the other side, to hold people accountable, um, to push for the laws that exist, to push for new laws, and, uh, and we can do it. And uh, it's, it's sometimes slow, these campaigns take a long time, and we can't do it alone, but working together, we can we can really make change. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Back here. Oh, the other person back here that's had her hand up for a long time. Oh, okay. Um, so how about there, there, and then there? Who is this? Oh, shadow proof. Oh, shadow Yeah. I have a question for you, John. You mentioned the various forms of torture um, that exist in the CIA. 
and to be able to speak about them, um, I'm assuming that means you must have seen these facilities or like seen this cool chamber rooms. So I was just wondering what the turning point was for you to go and speak out about this. Um, no, I, I didn't go to any of the black sites. When I turned down the training, that just ended it for me. But the techniques were circulated among all of us who who were aware of this torture program. The torture program in the beginning was very tightly compartmented. And you, you could count really on your fingers and toes the number of people inside the CIA who really knew that this thing was taking place. So when I saw the list of the list of techniques, that's when I objected to it. And as soon as I objected, they cut me out. With that said, I still knew a lot of the guys who had said yes. And so, you know, you run into each other in the hall or in the cafeteria or in the gym, and you say, hey, how's it going? And they start telling you their stories. And that's how I was able to keep abreast of everything that was, that was going on. You, you mentioned that the 13 of the 14 of you who were um, asked to do this enhanced interrogation technique, you said a lot of them probably did it out of a sense of shock of 9-11. And I'm wondering, you know, yes, the, the attack itself may have been a shock, but what was the CIA doing for the last 20 years yeah. that they were not aware of the sen sense of resentment building around the world about our empire? And I wish you'd comment a little about what who is in the CIA and what their perspective is of empire and all of that. At, this, at the CIA, you don't get very many free thinkers. <laughs> you know, the, they're very, very bright people, right? The best schools in the country, uh, hard foreign languages. Um, but the, the consensus is that you're there to take orders. One man I used to work for uh, very closely who rose to a very senior level. Um, I'm not going to mention his name because he's already testified against me in the grand jury. I'm sure he'd love to sue me. Um, but he said, in, in response to a reporter's question about me, that there was no such thing as whistleblowing. What it was was institutionalized insubordination. That's what he called it. And I responded, not to him, but to the reporter. Isn't that what the Germans said? in the 1930s. I was just following orders, you know, in Nuremberg in 45. Because you can't have institutionalized insubordination, can you? So I would counter that the shame is that they weren't all whistleblowers. They should have all said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're all smart, right? We all went to great schools, right? We all can think for ourselves. This is wrong. This is illegal. We shouldn't be doing it. And that conversation never took place. Okay, how about one more question and then we'll get to the book signing? I'd just like to ask what you think of this idea. Everyone in this room has availability to go to their city councils. And I'm thinking that there are enough people in America who have a conscience who would dare to stand up at the city council level and use the public forum to speak against what's happening in our nation. And if this was done in a concerted effort with all at the same time, in other words, flood city councils, flood county governments, where we can actually get to, to demand in a group kind of way, some kind of change in our country, is that uh, doable? And how many seniors would it take if that's what it took to sacrifice their lives to change our nation, how many would it take? That's a good question, Robin. Um, in, in North Carolina, there are some really terrific uh, grassroots groups that I've become acquainted with, like North Carolina Stop Torture Now, for example. And they've been working for years uh, to bring to account the employees of, uh, of a corporation called Aero. It's a charter uh, airline that actually shuttled prisoners between black sites, who were shuttled prisoners uh, for the purpose of extraordinary rendition to be tortured in third countries. I can tell you that they've been working on this for 10 years and have got, gotten absolutely nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. So I think really the concerted effort needs to come at the congressional level. 
because that's where real decisions can be made. Decisions on funding, decisions on investigations, for example. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee has in-house investigators. The, the Senate Armed Services Committee has in-house investigators. What the heck are they investigating? They're not investigating this. When I tried to on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a supposedly friendly chairman, John Kerry, killed it. Killed it in the crib and told me, we're not going to talk about torture. So. And, and I'm going to say that the grassroots activism is going to, I mean, that local work does eventually radiate to the congressional it, it level. It does. And, yeah. and, and we do need that. I mean, we, we do. We, we do need that, absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, my point wasn't that we shouldn't have it. My yeah, point yeah. is that we should look a level higher. Right. Okay, how about one more question? <laughs> Universal, this is the last. Universal jurisdiction, is there a uh, statute of limitations there and prospects for accountability for the um, highest ranking authorizers? Unfortunately, there's still a statute of limitations. The doctrine of universal jurisdiction um, is a very good doctrine. I mean, essentially it says um, any country in the world can prosecute anybody who's violated international law the Geneva Conventions, the Convention Against Torture. Um, there have actually been some countries who have started to investigate wrongdoing by US officials. Um, and in fact, there was a prosecution of some CIA agents in absentia in Italy where it, like 16 yeah. people were, mm -hmm. were prosecuted. The Abu Omar rendition. Okay, so yeah, there was a rendition in Italy and, and uh, there was a trial, the CIA agents didn't show up. but. Um, the other interesting thing is that um, uh, there, there have been groups who have talked about uh, prosecuting Cheney, Bush, Rumsfeld, Rice, um, all the insiders. And, um, you know, somebody asked a question about where are the lawyers. Um, there are groups of lawyers in these different countries. There's a big group in Canada, and every time Bush and Cheney try to sneak into Canada, um, they try to get the local prosecutors to arrest them. And in fact, Bush canceled a trip to um, uh, Switzerland one time because they were preparing papers to serve him. And so um, one thing that has happened as a result of this is that they have to be careful where they travel. <laughs> so, um, you know, so that's a good, good yeah, optimistic. They're imprisoned in the United States. <laughs> That's right. But That's we a big country. To, but. We've, we've actually tried to get local officials to um, <laughs> arrest uh, Cheney and Bush um, and Rice when they've been you here. And Obama. You keep leaving out That's Obama. Right. For well, That's I, right. I haven't had a chance to try to get President Obama arrested in Minnesota. <laughs> but we've tried to get these other people arrested when they came. We've gone to the U.S. Attorney. We've gone to the County Attorney. We've gone to the Police Departments. And I think that, that some of the officers are kind of sympathetic, but they, they all say they don't have jurisdiction. <laughs> but, and you know, they did bring ethical charges against you and Delahunty and Bybee in the states where they had uh, licenses to practice law and they were all dismissed. So I mean, it's not as though people haven't been trying to hold these people accountable. There have been several lawsuits that have been brought in this country. There, um, there was a lawsuit that was brought in Canada. Um, successfully, the government of Canada paid the guy $10 million. Um, it was actually uh, Harper who approved it, surprisingly enough. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he was actually um, captured in New York and rendered to Syria. He was a Canadian citizen, um, but you know that was kind of a famous case. But he also brought a suit in the United States, and it was dismissed. Most of these cases get dismissed on the grounds that um, there is a defense called national security. It always gets invoked in all of these cases, and almost every judge will dismiss a lawsuit based on the defense of national security because if the case is prosecuted, so-called national security secrets will have to come out into the open. So they raise this, the, the Justice Department raises the defense in every case, and every single case gets dismissed. And we need to keep fighting that narrative. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, thank you so much, everyone. It's been great to have you. Great questions. Forgive me for the crassness of shilling a book, but I owe my a lawyers $880,000 still. So, on sale, autographed hardbacks, 20 bucks. And I, and I have a charge, or a, yeah, a square reader. Thank <laughs> you.